questions, you look, you don't, instead of looking at me, look directly into that camera. Okay. That would be best. Sure. Now, you don't have to do that all the time. Okay. But for this, for the impact sure. of it, for the ver veracity, we need all that. Right. All right. <clears throat> uh, your name is uh, Catherine Pollard Griggs. Yes. You are the wife of Colonel George Griggs. Yes. 11 years of marriage. Yes. It's true that your husband is uh, and has been the head of special operations under Admiral Kelso, NATO. Yes. And it's true that you were the uh, head of the hospitality committee. Yes. You were the uh, member of the executive board of NATO's Wives Club. Absolutely. And uh, also that your husband's background includes uh, NATO Defense College in Rome. Yes. Princeton class of uh, 1959. Yes. His intelligence career, spy career began in Vietnam. Yes. And uh, it's also true that it continues under this day. Absolutely, under uh, General Wilhelm. And that your uh, husband was the liaison between the White House and President Jamal of Beirut, Lebanon, at the time of the bombing of the Marine barracks in uh, Lebanon. Yes. And in fact, your husband was an alcoholic. Absolutely. And probably Incredible. is to this day. Absolutely. And uh, during these drunken stupors, uh, he would so to speak, blab on and tell you everything he knew about the everything. intelligence community. Everything. Nothing was hid. No. It was like he wanted to relieve himself and burden, unburden his heart. Yes. And so he told you everything that you now know about yes. the intelligence community yes. and that you are talking about. And in fact, he told you that they knew the bombing was coming down in yes. Beirut before it occurred. Absolutely. And right. also, uh, by your association with him, you have come to understand and know uh, this, as shocking as this may sound yeah. to the people who are viewing this, that the United States military is literally run by sexual deviants heavy on the homosexual side. Tr truly. Um, and that the United, in the United States military, people like Jeffrey Dahmer and Kaczynski and McVeigh yes. and Oswald and a host of other people who yes. have a sexual deviant background, uh, primarily homosexual, these individuals are actually sought out by people within the military, the army, for, uh, the army, for yes. advancement into intelligence type yes. work yes. because they are so easy to control, yes. and uh, they actually become mind slaves. And that the U.S. Yes. military, yes. literally, as yes. as outrageous as it sounds, is a mind control operation. Yes, totally now, totally now. Okay. They've they've gotten rid of the good folks, like MacArthur. Got rid of them, one by one. Good. Totally take over. All right. Um, let's talk about the individual who uh, told you that we've never uh, actually been an enemy of the Soviet Union, that somehow that's yeah. all just been a scam. Who was well, that individual? Well, my husband. Um, when we, w the first three years we were married, um, he was drinking three or four straight gins, vodkas a night, a bottle of wine, and a beer machine beside his desk. Um, I only knew him two months before he asked me to marry him. He'd been married before, and his first wife was a, a total alcoholic. Now, someone would ask, why would you marry a man ask, after knowing him <laughs> only two months? I, I'm a, a strong Protestant Christian, and I, we, I have a lot of um, predestination. I'm a Scottish grandmother, and uh, I was working as assistant director of the Chamber of Commerce. I had a brand new relatively new Saab, my first car. It was an 83 Saab. I bought it secondhand from somebody who's 84. And my husband was driving an 83 Saab. Mine was a turbo, his was not. He um, rented part of my house. It was, um, I had a young doctor and his wife and two children who were renting the house. They were leaving before the end of the lease time and they put the ad in the paper and told me about all these people, and I said, no, 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 no. Um, and I was, um, had been engaged to someone else. You know, I, I was just renting my house out. And they said that there was this man who had a dog and a mother-in-law and a son and was a widower and uh, a Marine colonel. Well, I and it had a dog, and I said, no, absolutely not. So the point that I'm trying to make is that uh, he was someone I was not really, I didn't cotton to. He, he sort of acted like a robot. He was very clipped, and I didn't want to like him. But when I heard he was a, a Princeton graduate, I always thought that was kind of great. Um, when I heard he spoke fluent French, and I speak fluent French, 
when I found out that he drove a Saab, I drove a Saab. And when I found out that he went to the same school, high school, that my uncle had gone to, was in the same eating club at Princeton that my uncle Ben had gone to. He was on scholarship and uh, went to Princeton. Everything the same as my uncle, who was also in intelligence. But I didn't think about that then. I was just thinking, you know, this is God. This is uh, too much, too, too many similar things. And so it overwhelmed me. And he's very, very good looking. At that time, he was very good looking. Now he's aged and he's, he really is haggard. Had a rough life. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it, it, I was overwhelmed by him. Plus, my job at the chamber was very demanding. I was doing a great job. But um, he, he said that he, he wanted me to retire because he wanted to make general. And the man who could make him general was General Louis Buell, because it was just a matter of having somebody who would make you general, to be general. It wasn't what you did. Mm -hmm. Louis Jewell, you needed I mean, somebody Louis, above uh, to, just to pull you on up. Yeah, Louis just happened to die, and we went to his funeral, and George didn't make it, because Louis, Louis died. Mm. But his first wife had been, I, I'm sure, battered to death. Uh, I was battered, and, um, you know, but I thought it was just Vietnam and all this kind of thing. And I was trying to get him to stop drinking because I, I couldn't imagine how the Marine Corps would allow someone to be a total alcoholic who couldn't even carry on a normal conversation dry. I mean, he, he can't even carry on a normal conversation with anyone unless he's drinking. Hmm. He never smiled unless he had a, a, a glass in his hand. He drank solidly. I have a letter in his own hand that tells, and this is the truth, he drank solidly this amount that I just said for 30 years. His booze bill, and they never entertained, he and his first wife, was $250 a month. And this is from the naval store. Now think about that. Mm -hmm. He was totally snockered, just his whole brain, and yet he's working. He is head of running the, half the world's Marine Corps under General Al Gray. A, a man who is <sighs> mentally incapacitated. Totally. Unless he's inebriated, and then when he's, when he's drunk, I mean, he's in a different, altered state of mind. He can't s discern anything. He, he can, can follow orders. Oh, and that's all he does. And he told me when, I mean, one of our many conversations, uh, try, he was trying to... He thought I was, you know, because my family were all naval officers and I was out in the world with the chamber, you know, that I just sort of went along with this kind of stuff. And, um, yeah, I mean, it, it, it was just incredible to me that... How many, how many wives of high-up military people are there, like yourself, that are speaking out? Uh, none. <laughs> I mean, they're all 30-year Marine wives. They're, they're Stepford wives. They are petrified. I have had conversations before I went public, before I went to live with Sarah McClendon, who saved my life. And Sarah McClendon is the... The senior White House correspondent. Is she that little old lady we see on TV asking yes. the president those pointed, jabbing questions yes, all the time? the little red-headed, feisty Texan yeah. who broke the Billy Saul Estes thing. She's, she doesn't go along with the clone group of, of, of reporters mm -hmm. who are all, most of them, intelligence officers. I think she was in intelligence because she was in the Army during World War II. Mm -hmm. And uh, she's a, just a remarkable mind. And I lived with her for, for five, six months. Uh, and what's interesting is she called my home after I had called her or had seen her on C-SPAN, she couldn't get through to my house. I was living there by myself. Every time she called my home, this is 1996 from uh, March until she finally got hold of me, she had to go to another phone in Maryland to get me on the phone. Every time she called me from her house, she was told, this is a military base and the Griggses don't live here anymore. Now, I have, that was my phone number long before I met George Griggs. Mm -hmm. It's my granddaddy's farm. 
the, the house that I well, own. Well, so your phone was being diverted. Absolutely diverted. It's electronic warfare. Mm -hmm. It's part of their deception. Uh, they have many levels, but it's all under a big operation. They now, have an operation <coughs> now to totally ruin me. His first wife was murdered. Now, you know, s some of the things you talk about here, this big operation, you've come to understand about the, the largeness of it, the intricities of yeah. it, through a diary that you have. Is yeah. there, uh, yeah. could, you, could you hold that diary up so we can uh, yeah. get, a, get a look at that? And um, the thing that I found, uh, this is the actual diary. I'll just hold it up kind of like uh, a chest tie. Okay. There you go. And uh, these are the actual handwritten notes of your husband. Absolutely. And they reveal an awful lot. In fact, the, does the military or those in the intelligence community, do they realize you have a copy of this? They do now. You know. I had a phone conversation with General Jim Joy. How long ago was this? It was in February of 96. I tried to ask the colonels. They knew I was, I was on the uh, move trying to find information. Uh -huh. And um, okay, my write? husband had mentioned General Jim Joy. Yeah, it's hitting the microphone right there. Just oh, go sorry. Ahead. That's all right. All right. And I called General. I had to call a General Miller in Jacksonville uh -huh. who was in my husband's address book uh -huh. and Good. told him I was looking for Christmas card list and, you know, I, I needed General Joy's telephone number because um, one of the colonels whom I trusted uh, Colonel Ken Millis lied to me. Uh, Captain uh, Phil Hallwager lied to me. Uh huh. And um, so I, I got this General Jim Joy, who was the one who was in the Operation uh, Just Cause. Was it Just Cause, the one in Panama? Mm -hmm. He was in charge okay. of all the psychological operations, the booming music that they hit Noriega with, the chasing him around, the, well, the same stuff clothes. they did at Waco, too. Of course. We'll get to that well, in a minute. Yes. <laughs> okay. That's General Jim Joy, who mm. was behind Waco. Oh, I see. And General Carl Steiner, the snake. Okay. Who tried to steal Desert Storm away from Schwarzkopf. Okay, so, but you were trying to get uh, uh, some addresses, and they were giving you the complete runaround. Oh, don't even know him. Don't even know him. Don't even know him. And I knew him because my husband told me you know, that he worked with, with General Joy and General Steiner. They were the, the, the triumvirate. Uh -huh. But they had different names. They were, you know, in plain clothes. They were, had different passports. So I got him on the phone. I was given the number by this General Miller. And I said... So in the movies, when they say they shall disavow any knowledge... That's not just lie. a little. That's not just little thing for movies. That's the yeah. truth. They just yes. about knowledge of totally all these people. Totally lie. Yeah, but you nailed him down. Yes, I said, uh, General Joy. I'm Kay Pollard Griggs. Uh, my husband George Griggs was um, in the Marine Corps, and he is um, he's battered me badly, and we're looking for him because you know this has been going on too long, and uh, blah blah blah. And I was recording this conversation. You see. I was sitting on my bed with the diary right out in front of me. And he didn't know that I had the diary. He didn't know anything. It was cold call, like they do cold murders after mm -hmm. they, when they graduate from SEAL school. Cold, cold murders. I was doing a cold telephone call. And he said, no, I don't believe, and these were his exact words, <clears throat> no, I don't believe I know your husband. This is someone my husband, I have a card that General Joy sent my husband after the, the murder of the death of his first wife, saying, call me anytime, you know. This man, here I was, traumatized, battered, beaten, and he lies to me. Mm -hmm. So I said, I said, well, General Joy, that's funny, because... Um, I'm looking at my husband's diary when he was in Beirut, and you're meeting with him almost every day. I said, you know, at first, before that, I said, you know, he was the chief of staff for General Al Gray, you know, he's one of Gray's boys, you, you know, chief of staff of Fleet Marine Force Atlantic, runs half the world, all of the Middle East, 
NATO Defense College. You don't know my husband. You're a general. You live outside of Quantico. Don't know my husband. I made it very clear. Uh-huh. No. No. Can't say as I do. So then I, I told him about the diary. And, and these are all immature adolescent males. These are men who don't know how to deal properly with adult adults. They lie. They, they're deceptive. They, they hide behind trees. But when you nailed him on the diary, when the diary, he realized... He said, <laughs> he said, his exact words were, Oh, that George Griggs. Uh-huh. Oh, that George Griggs. And, and that's just the beginning of the kind of runaround deception that you've found with these people. Absolutely. And no doubt, that's why they they would like very much to have this diary. Yeah. Uh, this one page I found particularly interesting. What you, uh, and you're probably more familiar with their husband's handwriting, instead of me reading it, uh, read these notes that he had recorded there. Um, these might help. Okay, oh, I've, got, I've got these. All righty. Um, a number of the Marines told me uh, a little bit about Dale Dorman. Um, Dale Dorman's not a ha happy camper. Okay. Dale Dorman, um, because of some mistakes my husband made, was shot. This was at 7.15 to 7.30. Dorman exited Riviera. That was a, you know, a, a place, sort of a hiding place or whatever. Uh, gray and tan Mercedes. Um, up to five shots were fired. He raised his left arm. One, ran, one round penetrated his arm. One struck his chest. Walked back into Riviera to the desk and called post one. Security vehicle went to pick him up, returned to uh, Dora found 15 to 18 meters away and treated. Medvac called 750. Medvac um, wheels down at, at 0810 in a H-Bird helicopter. Riviera Hotel, approximately one, one ninth of a mile west of the embassy. Dorman has been there uh, since arrival, except, um, you know, briefly during a period of siege. He was not wearing protection. Uh, saw three men in the vehicle. One leaned out back with a shortened rifle or automatic weapon. Sentry at B-1 uh, saw and heard nothing. It's just one page of the diary. Sentry saw and heard nothing. Right. In other words, the sentry don't talk. doesn't talk. Right. right. Yeah. And <clears throat> there, there's just a whole world of these kind of assassinations and murders yes. and directed. In fact, at one point, your, your husband actually just discussed people being eliminated. Yeah, yeah. He, like you're shooting ducks. Yeah. So. Oh, we had, we had innumerable discussions over dinner. He'd already had his, his four gins. Ah. Now, he'll talk to any woman. Or anybody who drinks with him, he'll talk. This man, what is he doing in security? Y you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. at, when he was at NATO, I'll get right back to that, but when he was at NATO and he was the head of special operations, in fact, I've got copies of his secret uh, check in and out papers at NATO. He had them at home. I've somehow, you know, I hope, I hope I still have those, but anyway, the point is, um, I could get in and out of the NATO headquarters just walking in and there were all these shady looking garbage men and George would leave his office door wide open at lunchtime. He was flirting with a secretary who was a, a chief <coughs> who knew everything. You know, the point is, what lacks security? And I had to say, George, look, um, you have got to do something about the security here at NATO because I can walk in and out. He said, oh, just forget it. Forget it. Don't do anything. And I'm a very demonstrative person when it comes to security and honor and integrity and your word is your bond. My culture, my father, my people believe in, you know, in this nation, in, in, in my state, Virginia, my people, my culture, my God. You know, this is, mm -hmm. this is important. You don't just treat uh, that kind of thing lightly. So I said to him, if you don't do something, I'm going to Landis Kelso. I was in the wives club. She was the, the head. And Landis Kelso is the, the wife, wife of, of the... of Admiral Frank Kelso, who's a wonderful man, honorable man, wonderful woman. 
and I had a I had great rapport with her. I sort of stopped an international incident with the French and the English and the British who were ganging up against the French, and they were over, you know, something that was really minor, but it was huge. And she helped me. I, I determined that it was a problem, called her up, and she helped me, and we we diverted and averted a major thing. So I he knew what I would do, and I said, look, if you don't write a report and do something about this, then I'm just going to go to Landis and say what's happening. Point is that the man would, when he was in Beirut, he was sleeping with a spy and double agent Mary Clark Yost Lab, whose husband was a double agent, an Arab at the American University of Beirut. He leaves his, his briefcase wide open. He was with her for five weeks in a hotel. This is a married woman with two children and who followed him all around the United States, is still seeing him, met him in London, lived in Virginia Beach, was working in international programs at ODU you while say, he was married. Would you say your husband is fairly typical of these powerful oh, men? Oh, absolutely typical. Um, when, when I was single uh, working at the Virginia Center for World Trade, um, four of us old friends that I went to school with, Molly Holt and you know, a few others, we would go all together to a place called Poppy's. Um, at that time, he was Captain Jerry Unruh. Now he's Admiral Three Stars Jerry Unruh. This man, again, was married. He was running around with, with, the, with the tail hook crowd. I, I did not know he was married. I knew he was a, a Navy captain. I was told by him that he would be uh, taking command of the carrier Saratoga. Mm -hmm. Um, he followed me everywhere, even, even went to, up to uh, Wintergreen. Now, he sent me pictures, private, separate pictures of the Israeli guys waving to him. He was a, uh, a tailhook pilot, you know, these, the airplanes, mm -hmm. the jets. And he was a Mustang, um, but totally immoral totally and knew that he would never get caught. In fact, he was in tailhook. They had a big uh, party down at the beach and um, they were doing, I mean, I didn't go uh, by that time because I, I, I learned that he was married. And um, the, the point is that um, he and this whole group, I've, I've found out about Al Gray, you know, General Agra. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that, what is this, uh, this consistent thread of the sexual degeneracy and the homosexuality and just the raw, base nature that seems to be so prevalent? Have you ever determined what it is? I mean, why? Well, it's, it's a way to handle <coughs> them, to control them. I mean, years ago, you thought of people like General Eisenhower as, as an upright Man, uh, I don't know. Oh, well, I, I don't. I, I know some things about him. How far I, back can we go to to where you find people that are decent, and moral, and upright? Right. Where you had real people who defended the Constitution, who had a feeling. Robert of E. Lee was. <laughs> national. There were nationalists and and America first. You got to go back a good ways, probably. Oh, oh, a absolutely. Um, you see, growing up in Norfolk, Virginia. Uh, my whole family have been naval officers and also working. In other words, um, they would, would enter the, the service uh, during a time of, of war, of need, and uh, then they go back to, their, to being fathers and being husbands. I had a wonderful father, wonderful grandparents, wonderful family who put their family first. Well, they put their God first, Christ, and then their wives, and their sons, and their, their children. This, this is the way America was, was built. Now, these generals in the Marine Corps and Army, they don't look at it that way, according to my husband. Court, they, are, they are ordered, my husband being chief of staff, told his men it was like this. It's the Marine Corps first, the Brotherhood, the, the, the Cherry Marine, you know, the bonding that goes on. Mm -hmm. 
the Marine Corps comes before God, before Jesus Christ, before the country, and then, and then it's the uh, it's whatever the you know the the religion they have. I don't know because my husband is not a Christian; he's an existentialist, um, and most of these guys are. Uh, certainly, Al Gray is. Um, Krulak, I, I think his wife goes to church, but um, the. But their 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 God is this brotherhood. The brotherhood, and it's very German. It's very. Um, Does it have Masonic leanings? Oh, absolutely, Masonic leanings. In fact, the 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 uh, admiral who was the last admiral whose car my husband bought, he was very impressed with this Norwegian admiral. Mm. They're all Masons now. Mm -hmm. Not all Masons, but this brotherhood, Opus Dei. Uh, if they're, um, or the mob. I mean, the, the one thing I've been able to determine about the, the current Marine Corps, the Marine Corps that my husband came in with, Gray, Reap, uh, Sheehan, they're all mob. Now, when you say mob, you're talking mafia type New mob? Jersey mafia, right. Mm -hmm. Right. And there's a... Brooklyn. Brooklyn, New Jersey. Okay, is the mob and this, this military bunch, they're this one the, and the, the same? The Marine Corps is. guys are the hit men, and they, they are mercenaries. They'll work for anybody. You think the Marine Corps is under the Navy? No way. They can just as easily be under an Army colonel, and if the Army colonel meets a Marine Corps colonel, the Army colonel is superior. They'll switch hats just like that. My husband said it's just, you know, no big a deal. Uh, I'll go work for the State Department. I don't really. The Marine Corps is just a, it's like a, a smoke and mirrors thing. And they're run out of New Orleans, 4th Marine, Oswald. I mean, they are not on his level. He said, we've never been an enemy of the Soviet Union. They work with these communists. The, the man who started the whole, this whole intelligence operation, the OSS, he was recruiting known communists who were involved in the, uh, in the uh, Spanish subverting Spain. You know, what? there's no more. They're not Americans. They're not Christians. They're, they're uh, German existentialists. Now, what are they doing running our nation? I just, uh, it's, it's kind of, they have more affinity for the, the state of Israel right now than they do our nation. They don't care about American citizens. Um, the judges now in the courts are, are military officers following chain of command orders. They're not independent judges. So all this spills over then into the political areas like the uh, judgeships. Sure. Uh, They're all Marines. Senators, officers, congressmen. Sure. Who is John Warner? A Marine. Who is Chuck Robb? A Marine. They control the powerful committees. Dick Davis, Lieutenant Governor of Virginia. A Marine. His wife was, I hate to say it, well everybody knows, a Norfolk a prostitute. You know, Martha was a wonderful woman, I'm sure to him, but they were involved in organized crime. Uh, now I don't know, I know that our present governor in Virginia is an army officer. He takes orders. Uh, so the question that all of us wives are asking now is, well, who gives the orders? If they're told that we, the wives, are enemies, uh, how are the sons going to grow up? If the mothers who are teaching them truth mm -hmm. are lied to and the husbands are told, ordered by the likes of Al Gray, major homosexual, when he was in, in the... I shouldn't say this, but it's true. Mm -hmm. When he was in, in, the, uh, in Marseille, uh, the boys are called Gray's boys. He never married. Okay, until. the boys referring to everybody Lavender under boys, him. Everybody under Al Gray. And he had a separate organization while he was commandant that was a contract organization getting information on 
on people, having them, if they weren't corrupted, corrupting them, farming people so that he would have something on them so that they would use that later to control and manipulate them. It's like what happened to Newt Gingrich. All of these guys, like Newt Gingrich, Bill Clinton, who've gone through the sweats, <laughs> like Cohen, what, what happens is they get a little tiny thing that, to prove their power, how much power they have. They use guys like Michael Isakoff in Newsweek, or their little clones, you know, like Woodward, 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 Woodward and um, Bernstein, who are, mm -hmm. are operatives. Okay, they're former military, too. They're, well, oh my goodness. They were, uh, I believe it was Bob Wood Woodward, uh, it's either Woodward or the other one. Bernstein. See, I knew some British intelligence people. And I was told the whole story about how he was running around with Peter Jay's wife, who was the ambassador to Great Britain. And this man was sleeping with Peter Jay's wife. And there was a movie, uh, I think Jack Nicholson was this guy. And sh this was her story about what she went through while her husband, the, the columnist, was sleeping with the ambassador's wife to get information on what was going on in Great Britain. Now, this is, this is the team that, that broke Watergate. So what were the motives? Uh, of course, Watergate was horrible. And Nixon had something like 60 military JAGs alone working for him, doing dirty tricks. One of those JAGs was Ernest Frank Reynolds. Changed his name to Earn Reynolds. He came to me. I was farmed. Tim Hunter, a, an intelligence army operative, came to me with this story about, oh, you know, hard luck, you know, Saudi Arabia, and I was in the army, and I have this friend who can help you out with your legal case. He's a really good guy, you know, Ern Reynolds. And uh, if you meet him, I know he'll do some free legal work for you. So I was staying with Sarah, and I, I didn't have any money, and I, I was, but I took the little, you know, the, the, the train into, uh, where he, Fairfax, he met me in his Volvo station wagon with his jacket on. I didn't know what the big four meant on his leather jacket. And uh, he took me to his... Uh, and what did it mean? Fourth Marine. Oh, okay. Yeah. Operative. Mm -hmm. and, he, and he had the most fantastic uh, apartment. See, I'm a big book person, and I, I love, you know, reading history and everything, and I'm impressed by people who read, who are intelligent, who are wise. You have a master's yourself in? Scottish history, an Scottish. undergraduate in uh, Virginia history. Okay. I, um, I worked on the Dunmore Papers. I uh, studied with people like um, Ian Cowan and Jeffrey Barrow and Tom Devine. These are scholars in Great Britain who are experts on the Reformation and and my interest was Mary Queen of Scots at the uh, Reformation, and also Lord Dunmore, who was the last royal governor of Virginia, and I was working on the Dunmore Papers, too. I see. So, so you had an interest in, I mean, this guy's layout impressed you. Yeah. He's yeah. a real intellectual. Yeah, and he was divorced, you know, uh, a sorry, sad story and everything. Mm -hmm. Worked for the Justice Department, mm -hmm. was supposedly a whistleblower. Mm-hmm supposedly a Christian. So this guy's really going to help you out? Mm. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Boy, did I buy into that. <laughs> it's like the old story, I'm from the government, I'm here to help you. Oh, yeah. So I caught him sneaking around my house at 2 o'clock one morning. <laughs> 2 in the morning? Yeah. And, of course, I'm most gullible in school, you know. So I, and I'm trusting, I'm a Christian, and I always look to the good side of somebody. I see the good little part. It took me about three times. The guy had my original documents that had just been in my briefcase under his car seat. He invites me to a cybernetics conference in, in Champaign, Illinois. I leave Martha Roundtree's apartment, and it's arranged so that all of my things are in his safe little car, and we're going to his parents' house in Roanoke, and, of course, you know, you can't take all your things to the cybernetics conference because I was going home 
Mm -hmm. But this is a smooth psychological operations guy. I mean, he is doing psychological operations on a woman in Champaign, Illinois, who is the lover of a, of a German spy, uh, who he's been writing letters to her, and he's, he's showing me these letters. The guy's perverted. I mean, he's writing Susan Parenti, these letters, you know, like invading her mind, and, you know, why are you... And Susan's written him two letters or three letters. She's very beautiful, and he's got pictures. But he's sharing these letters with a group of men, seven men, one of whom is head of intelligence, is head of computers and the intelligence for the Army, Ron Jarmuth. Now, Ron Jarmuth comes right out and says, I'm an anarchist. You know, I mean, his family are New York old uh, Zionist Jews. He, he met his wife and I think, a, in a uh, kibbutz. You know, I mean, he's a nice, personable guy, but when you say to, to somebody like me, I'm an anarchist, just so blithely, and you, you know, and, and he's always over at Ern's house, and Ern's got a picture by his bedstead drawn by a man who's a known homosexual whom he met when he was at the University of Virginia, who was the chaplain at Hollins College, who my best friend was there, and she said, he's a well-known homosexual, and I'm thinking, what is a picture of Ern Reynolds doing being painted when he's young by this known homosexual. And then I find out that the man who enlisted him in the Republican Party, he was doing dirty tricks for seven years for the Republican National Committee. I mean, dirty tricks. As a, underneath this man from West Virginia who was a homosexual and left all of his money to Ern's son and took his son on a trip. Now, uh, and Ern is, is a, a lobbyist for homosexuals. He's just, you know, working in the uh, Episcopal Church. He's, he's got a group of women that he meets with at the seminary. He's, he's, I'm sure that my case, my profile, he's probably got charge of it now. He's the expert on Catherine Pollard Griggs, but he's not. The guy is absolutely not grown up. But he's a thief. Uh, and so, he your, was your a case, dad. your case, just got Stonewall, just got sucked into a memory hole by a guy who was acting under orders to. Sure. You get you get Kathleen Griggs under your control, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. that's that. Sabotage her. Sabotage. Yeah. Sure. And he stole your documents. Sure. And sure. Sabotage me. Turned on me right in the middle of the commissioner's hearing. Mm. Laughed at me when I cried. You know, this is a guy who hates women. And uh, the interesting thing is I went to his family home, and he had a wonderful mother. Um, and he told me that his father battered his mother. Mm. Uh, his father was in the Marine Corps. And there was a picture of Chesty Puller in the basement. Well, that fits the profile, though, though yeah. doesn't it? I mean, if his father battered the mother, mm -hmm. which he grew up in this dysfunctional environment. Totally dysfunctional. So when he hit the military or he was noticed in college or ROTC or whatever, uh, so here's a guy who is susceptible to mind control. Sure, he's, he's to got... To be developed. Yeah. I think he used the term for budding. He, he was... Recognized as a potential bud. Yes. And he's moving up the ranks. His roommate was from New York, was a Zionist, uh, and he was an outcast at the University of Virginia. An outcast? Yeah. Why would he be an outcast? He felt he was an outcast. So he had this roommate, and I don't know this man who was uh, the homosexual from West Virginia. Uh -huh. And we had to go by through his town and, you know, the guy died. But uh, this homosexual was a friend of the homosexual at Hollins, who was a chaplain there at Hollins College, whom I met. We had lunch with him one day. Um, the father had the picture of Chesty Puller and so forth. Well, Ern, um, I knew he was, was um, trying to sabotage me and so forth because I had already had 
Alexander Robinson come down from Princeton every other weekend, my husband's teacher, um, who was also a Marine, whose family brought over the Saudi royals, who was one of my husband's teachers. And um, I caught him walking around my house at 2 o'clock in the morning. I overheard him talking to my best friend's mother saying, now we just, you know, undercutting me. You know, we just don't know. Kay is just under so much stress, you know. Oh, and he's a very handsome, very dignified guy, you know. Went to Columbia University, was uh, in um, Algeria, that area with the Marine Corps. Then went into the boys' school, the Hun school. Um, he's an intelligence, without a doubt. His uh, brother-in-law was uh, Bill Eddy. Colonel Bill Eddy, who was the, I believe it's the brother-in-law, I've got to get, his name is Eddy and it's Bill Eddy, but he was the translator um, for the Saudi royals during the Roosevelt administration. And the Roosevelt, the, the New York crowd, was trying to steal all of those countries away from Great Britain. The Balfour Declaration had sort of come in and there was a guy named Moose, not the present Moose who has the Africa desk at the State Department, who's an African American, but this was a guy named Moose who uh, helped the State Department steal Saudi Arabia away from Britain. Because Britain was allowing the Saudis to be Saudis you know, to keep their religion, mm -hmm. to keep their culture. Right. They were not trying to kill people right off the bat, you know. So George is, is part of that OSS crowd. Mm. And <clears throat> their stock and trade is just murder, assassination. Absolutely. Uh, creating uh, conflicts, phony yeah. baloney wars, yes. conflicts, yes. for the purpose of uh, making Selling weapons, money. Selling money, drugs. Drugs. Controlling the drug flow. Now, let's, let's talk about the drug flow in the United States. Yeah. Uh, based on your conversations with your husband. Mm -hmm. uh, I met drug lords through him. <laughs> such as? I met the head guy. See, George was telling me everything. First three years of marriage, it was just like, you know, you're with me, gal, because he was so used to talking to Mary Halab and Anne Bouchou. Yeah. You know, the group partnerships with sex and all this stuff. And... And, you know, I, I'm a pretty loving woman, and I'm fun. I was then. I was but you're not into swinging. No, I'm not and, into and swinging. And swapping husbands and no, wives. No, and George was into swinging. He and Sue and, and Nancy and Jim Earl. You know, I mean, this was, and I heard about that from colonels mm -hmm. and one Navy captain. But then your husband also would tell you that this is just life the way it is. Oh, yeah. In our crowd. Oh, yeah. Uh, all it. these generals, admirals, colonels, oh, yeah. all these people. Yeah. Uh, Men, too. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, but he was, he was just um, trying to remember what we were on something that was, um, that, that I was going to say, and I remember, um, I well, you know, I, anyway, <laughs> I can't uh, remember. Oh, he's talking about the, the fact that uh, they're into making money, and yeah. this, this is yeah. the drug business. Oh, yeah. So, you met, all, you met all these drug yes. lords. I met. Fahim. Um, As if they were just business partners. Oh, yeah. Well, he told me what they did. Mm -hmm. he, you know, Fahim was a colonel. He's, he's in the diary, too. Um, but they, George said they, what they do is they nurture, they cultivate the, the sons of prominent families in all, the State Department finds them. Mm -hmm. They're called rising stars. Yeah. And they turn, that's the word they use, George mm -hmm. used, they turn them, they, um, they, they bring them in, they, they rope them in, what, if they're alcoholics, give them more booze than anybody, if they want women, you know, they find the women, they turn them, and, uh, and then let them know, if, you know, if they ever get in any trouble, come on over here, we'll take care of you. Well, Fahim had come on over here, things were getting hot in Beirut. He was a Catholic. He was um, very prominent family, 
And he was going in hiding up in Maine. I remember I had his number, uh, and I, I talked to his sister. But they, they just called a lot of the stuff out of the house um, the, the very first time when George kind of disappeared. And, you know, uh, and then I found out about what happened with Sue, mm -hmm. his first wife, yeah. and, and all of that. Well, now, did they... Um <clears throat> did you come to learn how drugs actually come into the country? Yeah. Uh, I saw a, a news piece one time where a yeah. pilot who was in prison uh, alleged that they actually landed on military bases with oh. huge planes loaded oh. with dope. Th this is how they, they all brought them in, the Norwegians, the, the Brits. Um, the, the drugs, you see, they would come down through uh, Burma, Turkey, they, they'd come through the Bekaa Valley. The banks were in, in Beirut. Uh, they were in uh, Panama, Mexico, in uh, St. Thomas after, you know, the laundering of cash. You see, mm -hmm. cash, that's why some of the banks in New York, you can very easily find out who the drug lords are. Barry McCaffrey, I saw him two weeks ago, and he said something, he let it slip out. He's an army general, you know. He said, We're, we haven't done any more or any less in the last five years. Now... <laughs> in terms of the war on drugs? Yeah, no. They're just holding it. The word uh -huh. he used, I think, was holding it. It was a word that he, you could tell they'd used in briefings. In, uh, they were, the, war, the, the guys who were doing the drugs are military officers. In fact... Doing the drugs meaning controlling, controlling them. the flow. Oh, yeah. In fact, one of George's best friends, Colonel Ray Moore, I suspect that Ray Moore, Ray Moore was from the gang, the ghetto area in California. His wife is a very, was a very good friend of mine, Charlotte. She's dead? No, oh. he is. Oh, he is. But he, when George would sort of disappear... Your husband? Yeah. All of a sudden, they would appear and be in the house. You know, calm me down, take me over, exercise, you know, do all this mystical stuff. And it was really funny because they came back from Mexico. And it was, George just happened to disappear and they were right there, you know. Well, Ray Moore, all this stuff, I knew about his background and I started thinking, what's going on in Mexico? Why the heck is Ray going down to Lake Chapala? And he would talk about his day. His day would be going out with the men, playing golf, going to this uh, spa with the men, you know. They were doing deals, going to Guadalajara. And there would be Tom Reap, another former chief of staff for Gray, going to Mexico. There would be uh, Ken Millis, another temporary chief of staff when, when George's wife funeral took place. There was, there was uh, Ken Millis. Um, now these are, these are guys who are part of what we call the Brotherhood. Uh, and they're all going down to Mexico. So what, what's going on in Mexico? Ray's one of these guys who wants to sit and go sit in the sun. He doesn't want to go down there to Mexico and do all that stuff. Mm -hmm. But he did. And he got cancer all of a sudden. And another guy got cancer all of a sudden, right after he got out of the Marine Corps. Now, not to, uh, not to diverge uh, from what we're talking about right now, but um, did your husband ever tell you anything about any disease warfare, like giving people mm -hmm. sicknesses? And, yeah, and, uh, yeah, that's part of They call it, he called it uh, ABC, NBC was something like nuclear, biological, chemical, um, ABC, atomic, biological, chemical. Uh, they call it biologicals. Uh, and in fact, his, I'm not going to mention his name because this is a guy who's really a good guy who scared the word they use is shitless. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. Mm -hmm. But that's the word. Mm -hmm. This guy is petrified. Because? Because he's doing that work. The, the chemical? And biological work. The marine... You mean the laboratory work or the uh, implementation? Dealing. 
subterfuge, deception in okay. the Middle East. Okay, and they use uh, he's a Marine Corps disease-causing drugs. Absolutely. Uh, and then, how do they administrate them? With in in missiles and in uh, I mean these this is this is an elaborate big business. <sighs> like Peter Kawaja, mm -hmm. Marine Corps guy, who's working in plain clothes at one of the, the plants in Florida. This is, this is why George is in Florida. This is why they're all down in Florida, because all of this stuff is, is being... We manufactured the chemicals and biologicals that were in Iraq. Mm -hmm. Now, if you don't believe me, you don't believe Peter Kawaja, a Marine Corps colonel, who's, he says they killed his wife, I believe him. He worked in one of these factories. It was supposedly a candy factory where they were manufacturing deadly, deadly killer things. The Marine Corps, Al Gray, Krulak, Carl Mundy, he's in the CFR. He was in Ken Millis's class, who was the chief of staff, the one who controlled me. You know, I went to his mother's house in Seven Mile, Ohio. Flo, his father was a German Nazi. I'm not saying that you know, being a German Nazi is bad, but he's part of this group. And if you don't believe me, if you don't believe Peter Kawaja about the, the drugs, you can, I mean, it's, it's just, um, it's, it's, everybody knows. There's a guy named Randy Abair, Lieutenant Colonel, hero, American patriot. This is a guy who should be the Commandant of the Marine Corps. Krulak. I'm talking to you, I'm talking to Al Gray, I'm talking to you, Carl Mundy. You all are adolescent, immature, I call you twerps. You're liars, you cheat, you steal, you kill, you're beneath the contempt of any of your wives. They are scared to death. Why do you do this to your wives, guys? Look at that tape of Randy A. Bear. I knew Chesty Puller, and this is a strong, wonderful guy. I knew his wife, Virginia Mack. I knew a real Marine. You can't say that you knew them because you didn't. I did. Randy A. Bear stood, sat. He could hardly talk. He was leading a platoon into Iraq. His wife was sitting to his left. His wonderful father was sitting to his right. And he said that his his colonel, he's a lieutenant colonel at that time, I believe he was a lieutenant colonel, he said, my colonel ordered me, he said, our, all of our registers were saying, this is danger, there are chemicals, biologicals everywhere. I was told, and I was, you know, followed orders, and he was having a hard time talking. His wife was, this is a young guy, his wife was having to interpret for him. Mm. He was crying. He'd been turned on by you guys. He said, on those canisters, on those boxes were American, American flags. Those were American biological biologicals agents. that we were walking into that killed me, that you, Gray, and you, Scrocoff, and you, McFarlane, and you guys knew, you, Ed Wilson, best friend of my husband, you all sold to Saddam Hussein. And not only that, I talked to the man who trained the woman who was sent over from Iraq to learn how to build the biologicals and chemicals, the, 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 the plants. She was trained here in the United States, and you all know that. And Randy A. Bear's testimony says everything that I could say a million times better because this is a man who's a real man, unlike the generals, unlike the colonels. This is a real hero. Now, is Randy A. Bear, is he still alive? I don't know, and I hope and I pray to God that he is because this is the man who should take over our Marine Corps or his wife. Some, that's why they don't have any women in special operations. 
because that's why they don't have any any african americans they're too honest they're too strongly christian now the only uh guy i know who is um who is involved is is a homosexual who and his buddy is a is an israeli agent hmm. and they are lovers they're a pair but well, now, as he's the, now a colonel, and he is under the guidance of Ken Millis. Okay, now as these, these generals, over the period of years, this is consolidated mm -hmm. to where they're all part of this club. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is something that's been going on for years and years and years. Members of the firm. Okay, the so as the firm grows, mm -hmm. even as the, guy, the old guys, the gray heads, get old, die off, retire, whatever, they already set in motion a system that culls out these young budding rising yes. stars and they move their way yep. up yep. well then in time it consolidates to where no one no one is in this unless they're in the club absolutely so is it is your conclusion based on what you know from your husband's revelations reading his diaries mm -hmm. this sort of thing mm -hmm. is there anybody in the US military the army or marines anybody in the in the the level of you know your generals and your your colonels and the is there anybody who would not be in this club? There's nobody who doesn't know. In special operations, I would say, and I would, I would put money in the bank on this, not one of them is not a party to this. It's not a, once they get that bird, Colonel, that bird, they mm -hmm. go through an initiation <clears throat> ceremony. This is not a, and my husband told me about that too. What's the, what's the initiation ceremony like? They get them drunk. Uh huh. Dining in, shell back. Uh, he, he told me. Oh, dining in. This is a term that they use. Oh, yeah. A code yeah. word. Oh, yeah. Shell yeah. back? Shell back. They, uh, what's that mean? Anal sex. But, but they get them really drunk. The, the guys who were that way do it. It's a group situation thing. And I was told by two colonels who said, you know, it's normal, Kay. This is just what we do in battle, you know. This is just good old boys. This is just what we do, Kay. They get drunk and they They have get drunk and they ejaculate. They beat each other off. You know, it's, it's awful. Now, uh, I'm not God and I'm not going to judge them and their souls. Um, this is a well-oiled system. Uh -huh. And when you've got the Commandant well known as a Cherry Marine, Cherry Marine, Cherry Marine. Which means? Bottom. They're the bottom. The Navy guys are on the top. It, it, think about this, because Walter Chrysler in Norfolk, they, each port has a hierarchy. Uh -huh. Wealthy at the top. Walter Chrysler and Phil Hornthal. Everybody in Norfolk knows that. Where'd they meet? In the Navy. I was engaged to Jack Mace when I was at the Virginia Center for World Trade. He ran the Maritime Association, the Shipping Association. Always dealt with the labor union guys. Always all male banquets. All, and I, I, I couldn't understand why, you know, I was engaged and I couldn't even go to the thousand man banquet. You know, mm. had a big argument about that. Ah. Uh, Rock Hudson, where did he meet his guy? Navy. Jim Neighbors, Navy. All of these guys, Navy. So they're tapped for whatever it is, acting, singing, you know. The point is, Liberace, you know. Was um, he Navy? I, I believe he was. I, I know that um, he was, uh, someone told me that he was a friend of one of the guys in Norfolk, there was a ring, a VMI ring of men um, in Norfolk, and I knew they met once a month, and some of them were married, some of them weren't. But they were all Navy. They were Army, Navy. In other words, it was kind of a group of men in Norfolk. And then I found out that the organizations, like um, right now, the uh, Al-Anon is run by homosexuals. The... Um, uh, Better Business Bureau, the Community Fund, which is the, uh, I forget what it's called now, I'm, I'm so old, I'm 55, it used to be called the Community Fund, that guy, They're, uh, Jack Mace, 
you know, and I'm, I'm wondering which one is it, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they all are, and the guys know it. So what's going on here? You know, they know it. They, oh, Old Dominion University, the uh, Clyburn, um, intelligence family. He was well known. Two reporters on the Virginian Pilot who do the very important columns and so forth. Uh, I mean, it's, it's just, uh, so I'm saying, who's making the decisions to do this? They're military. What is the reason behind it? Why do they keep the wives out of the loop? Mm -hmm. uh, so when people questions. suggest that the United States of America is becoming a modern day Sodom and Gomorrah, Absolutely, without this it. This really is, is not just a broad generalization. No. That this club, as it's grown over the years, and then placing and promoting the key people in every strata of life. Right, banking. Mm -hmm. Then uh, the whole thing, not only the military is run by yeah. degenerates yeah. and top heavy with yeah. degenerates, yeah. people who are moral can't possibly move their way mm -hmm. up because no, they, they don't qualify. Them. They kill them, they get rid of them. They can't be controlled. No. Uh, one example, I was, I was the executive secretary for the, well, the Virginia Center for World Trade had a board of the most important, supposedly the most important leaders who were picked out by Jerome Weiner, Jerry Weiner. Mm -hmm. I was a shill for that. Uh, I had, you know, done a lot of great things at Old Dominion. They wondered why I did it because I'm, they don't understand Christians. Mm -hmm. And uh, he knew I was a worker, so they hired me to go over to the World Trade Center, the Virginia uh, Port Authority. I had an office in there. And Jerome Weiner, what's interesting is Mary Clark Collab worked for him. Okay. The girl who had my job, who was a normal woman like me, because there were few who were not so normal, uh, like Bobby Bray, not the Bobby Bray who ran the Port Authority, but another Bobby Bray. He was very nice, but he was a known homosexual um, who worked with Weiner. But his secretary was pushed out of a window. Now, it was all hushed up. Of course, she committed suicide. Yeah, this was a young mother who had a baby who knew too much about his money laundering. I reported the, the money laundering that Book and Weiner, now this is a professor head of international programs at Old Dominion University, Jerry Weiner, whose father was very high up in this Zionist group. Mm -hmm. Jerry Weiner was doing intelligence work in Algeria, in Morocco in particular. Uh, he organized this board that I was the secretary for. He was a very sick, mean guy. I mean, you talk about <clears throat> really <coughs> water. Um, but Jack Mace was on the board um, and there was a banker on the board. We can take a break. And <laughs> Take a break. Yeah, don't, uh, did you stop it yet? No. No, don't stop it. We'll just leave these synchronized. And uh, is your wife getting a, a cup? Yeah. I'm sorry. It's, oh. it's, uh, I was thinking I could use a little But drink. Gustavo. Do you need to was, use the restroom or anything? Yeah, no, I'm fine. I just am thirsty. But Gustavo, life. Gustavo, I love the guy. He was from Columbia. Mm -hmm. He was in Virginia, Na in Virginia National Bank, which is now Nations Bank. And, you know, I didn't put him, because I had studied Latin American history under a wonderful Dr. Blossom. I knew a lot of stuff about Latin America and Nariño and how Panama became a part of uh, our country and, you know, now, I mean, I understand it was drugs and running things through and everything, but Gustavo was in charge of all the, uh, the laundering that was going on in Virginia National Bank in the port. And where did he go after that? He went to Florida. <laughs> and he introduced me to Anna Maria Quintero whose brother was one of the big mobsters. I mean, the big, you know, Colombian. You know, I, I met Anna Maria Quintero. See, I don't forget some things like this. It's, 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 that's why they don't like me. Uh, because 
I imprint on f wonderful foreign people. I want to know them. I want to send Christmas cards. And, um, and it's not very good to have, um, have somebody like a little magnet. I'm, I'm sort of like a Monica. <laughs> you know, seek, she's seeking out uh, sex with important guys. I'm wanting to uh, meet people like that from different cultures because I want to learn about them because that's what Christ said. You go out and you minister to the people who are foreigners. You don't just spend your time necessarily with uh, the, the, the home people. You need your home people as a base. But you need to go out and, and find out truth and spread goodness everywhere. Truth is goodness. Truth is light. And that's what, what Christ is all about. You, you're not afraid to learn truth. You're not... Thank you. You know, all these cathedrals and things that were built in his honor. Why? He was wonderful. Mm -hmm. Why was he wonderful? Not because he, he hung around a little group but because he was out trying to. It, he told the big guys, look, stop being bullies and cowards. Let the poor people into your church. Everybody, God gives us all a unique spirit. Mm -hmm. it, our, our, our timing is different. Everybody's fingerprints are different. Eyes are, we have the right to read the Gospels. Yeah. They shouldn't keep the Bible from us. That's right. The church is not a political organization where you've got a few little guys up here telling all the mothers what to do. Mm -hmm. who, were, who were the ones with Jesus Christ at the, you know, when at, on the third day? There was not one disciple there with him. It was the three women. So why are we leaving women out? Mm -hmm. Women, in Scotland at least, my culture, are, we're partners with our men. We, we need the authority of a husband. We want a strong, moral husband. But what is that uh, passage, uh, you know, about the, uh, the good wife? You know, I can't remember. It's in... Uh, in Proverbs. I mean, the virtuous Proverbs. woman. And, yes, yeah. yes. Right. I mean, she's buying, selling property. Yeah, right. She's, she's doing everything. She's certainly not a no-brainer. So why keep, yeah. her, why keep her at home barefoot and pregnant? Mm-hmm and not being able to read and speak three languages and, and welcome all the foreigners and, you know, to come in. Mm -hmm. Hey, that's what Jesus Christ would be doing. If he were right here, he would be here right with me saying, go for it, little woman. <laughs> you know, I'm giving you the strength to, to tell the daggone truth. And if you get killed tomorrow, you're going up there. You're going to live forever. That's anyway. right. Well, now these... Uh you mentioned when you get to be a bird colonel, and they have this initiation that involves all the sexual debauchery. Yeah. Now would Drinking first. Get them good and drunk. Oh, big time drunk. Because there would be some of these who, uh, if they were sober, they wouldn't go through couldn't with it. Couldn't go through with it. Right. They'd have to be blasted. Yes. yes. Okay. Yeah. And now do you suppose, I don't know, your husband maybe told you, when they go through this, this, all the stuff that they do, are there people there gathering information? Of course. Intelligence on them? Of course. The chaplains are intelligence. You know, in, the, in Nazi Germany, the, you had to tell on your parents, or in the Soviet mm -hmm. Union, they, they encourage you to tell on your parents. Uh -huh. Phil Holwager, uh, the guys who go to Yale who become chaplains, the chaplain corps is tell all the tales on everybody. They have collections agencies. They, these Marines are ordered to go and collect so-and-so at so-and-so. If a Marine tells truth, if he's a whistleblower, if the wife is too much trouble, they collect them, they throw them in, they fill them full of chemicals, they'll do, they'll implant little things in them. I, I believe that my husband has an implant. Well, now, McVeigh said he had a chip implant. I believe George did. Now, now ask yourself, all right, George, I know George has a, a male, had a male friend. 
Yeah, yeah. he has they have male friends. Your, hus your husband is bisexual? Yes, he's bisexual. Uh, and I was told that by colonels and a captain, uh, by a, a psychiatrist. Um, uh, what percentage do you think of these higher-up people are bisexual? Oh, all of them. If they're, if they're in special operations, if they're Marines, they're, they're all bisexuals. They've all had to do it. In order to get to be a bird colonel, mm -hmm. special oper the SEALs, it's kind of like the fast road to the top. Uh, the now. So a guy could not be a seal without having. Oh, I don't. I don't. This. I don't believe so. Mm. I, I haven't met one that I don't believe would have done it. And judging from what a couple of colonels told me, it's just that's the norm. It's just you women. You know, y'all are so sissy. Y'all are just. You know, you don't. You don't understand how it is. We're under so much pressure. And when Valerie Wilhelm told me that. About Charlie, I just could not believe. What Charlie Wilhelm would be a. He's a he's a he's a general now down in Miami, and she was just saying, oh well, you know, he's run around. He has to, she said. He's under so much pressure. And and I just and and she was saying um, that of course I had met Charlie in Norway, um, and Charlie is sort of someone my husband <coughs> just idolizes. And um, he uh, and Michael O'Boyle is another one. Uh, Michael is my husband's special friend. And when my husband retired, uh, we went to Al Gray's office. This was a traumatic thing for me. It was a really weird day. Um, we drove up with his son Douglas and my son Garland. We went to the Commandant's office. They had, you know, something to nibble on and eat and, you know, just a, a little something. And his wife, Jan, came over from 8th and I Street, the Commandant's house, with her dogs. She sleeps with stuffed animals and dogs. I don't think there's any lovemaking that goes on with, with Al Gray and his wife, quite honestly, and neither do the colonels. Um, she is a wonderful, sweet person, scared to death. She worked for his intelligence organization. And then she supposedly took care of his mother. And then they married, you know, because you, he, he would not have made it. Everybody knew he was, he was a homosexual, not a bisexual. This is a homosexual commandant. Mm -hmm. I um, talked to people who actually, one woman who went to one of the parties, she was French, and she married a naval officer. And it was when George and I were first married, and I told George about what she said about General Gray. She said, you cannot believe this man is totally debauched. This man is, is, does these group sex orgies in, outside of Marseille, France. He's just horrible. You know. She said, now I have to admit, I was party girl, you know, went to these parties and um, so forth. But... Uh, she, what, what would happen is, and I met a, a guy in the laundromat who was very, very, um, he was enlisted and he was involved in, in Beirut and he knew my husband. He was uh, going back and forth from Gaeta to the uh, uh, New Jersey, the ship, and then, you know, into Beirut on the beach and everything, and he worked for an, an admiral. Now, this is a, this is a big admiral. And the Admiral, would they would go to these parties at this big mansion outside of Marseille. What they did was they invited the, the wild girls, the secretaries, because this went on in, in Indonesia. My husband had a secretary. Anne Bouchou's husband, Hank, was sleeping with the secretary. My husband was sleeping with the secretary and Anne Bouchou. They were doing, because my husband's wife wasn't there, so they had their little menage à quatre. Mm -hmm. um, and, of course, my husband was sleeping with Anne Bouchou, who's now, he says, a, a, a lesbian, you know, but he was sleeping with her and, you know, r called her right after his wife died the night, you know. And I found the telephone numbers and, you know, her address and her birthday and all these letters he was writing. Isn't there a disease that runs rampant with these oh, people? yeah, yeah. So, um, but Al Gray, uh, this guy, 
uh, would guard the parties. Now, how does that make a young guy feel who's got a child? He's guarding an orgy with Israelis. There were Israelis at these parties. Intelligence people. Intelligence? There's not intelligence there. There's perversion. There's, there's psychological, uh, you know. They're, these guys are abnormal. They're adolescent. They're not full, complete people. They're, they can't have normal. Anyway, so he's guarding the parties, and he says, the secretary, the girls come in, they stay till about 11. They're all nude, all nudists. The Earls, Jim and Nancy Earl, my husband, Ty Kroll, most of the uh, 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 chiefs, nudists. Um, makes it easier, you know, to see the little, you know, it's terrible. They're, they're nudists in the sense that... Yeah, they're, they're nudists. Okay, so they have whatever. Freedom. Mm -hmm. Oh, I see. Freedom. Um, it's really kind of religious, isn't it? Yeah. With them. Yeah. Yeah, but the girls, the women leave at about 11 o'clock. This is what he said. I mean, I knew the girls were there because I'd already talked to, the, talked to the French girl. And he said, well, you know, what they do is the women leave at about 11 o'clock, maybe 1 o'clock, and the guys all stay around there. And, and it's just the ritual. Mm -hmm. This is what they do. So, and then I, then I found out... Um, and these are the guys that send their boys to war. Yeah, these are the, guy, the big guys. Then I found out, because my husband would mention this guy and that guy, you know, that he went to school with. Bob Edwards is involved with this stuff. But the guy who recruited him, Charles Caddock, who was a well-known homosexual, who was the, quote, head teacher but the bodyguard for the Saudi boys. See, the Saudi boys were encouraged to do this to corrupt them. <coughs> mm. They were corrupting Muslims who would not have done this ordinarily. Mm -hmm. The parties at Aramco, they would give the young boys, get them really drunk, and encourage Muslim sons to do this kind of stuff. Muslim sons who would have a strong tendency toward um, morality. Yes. Yes. And to abhor this kind of conduct. That's right. But if they could get them drunk and loaded enough that they would do yes. this one time, yes. then they would gain a controlling edge on these guys. And who do you think did it? Charles Caddock and Borland, these guys, Alexander Robinson, Cheeseboro, who was the headmaster. The Saudis bought Russell House at the Hun School in Princeton. They brought over Mohammed Faisal and, you know, Saud, Khalid Saud. They didn't really go to classes mm -hmm. or whatever. And who was the young man who was partying with them? My husband, George Griggs. Who was in the group with them? Einstein. I mean, I, I, my husband was partying with Albert Einstein. I said, well, you know, I didn't. And, I just, and when would this have been? At what age in 52, his life? 52, 53, 54, okay. 55. Um, I believe he said that Mohammed came over in 54. It was right after the murder, <coughs> the poisoning of the one who was really good. Okay. The, so your uh, husband would have been a young guy, 18, 19 years old? Oh, he was, he was only, when they first got to him, he was in high school. So he was, he was ninth grade. And he would be there? He was at the school with these homosexuals. They sent his parents to California, got him a little Boy Scout job, his father. He didn't see his parents for eight solid years. And this is amazing. I see. So then the transference is these people become your parents. Oh, they're the of ones course. you look up to. Yeah, but they're doing things to you. Sure. Oh, they're sodomizing you. Of course. And Albert Einstein was actually. Was in that homosexual group, bisexual group. Absolutely. Camus, Camus. Sartre. Camus. Uh, now, Camus did not, I don't believe my husband actually met Camus, but Camus was a lover of his French teacher at Princeton. Not Todeve, not the one who helped him with his paper whom he had an affair with. And I was told that by normal roommates whom he had later on and by another roommate. Um, they knew George was doing this stuff. 
George was, um, he was a cheerleader. Um, he was a French major. He were there, were there any other young teenagers from that particular setting yes. that, was, that were also being Bob cultivated? Edwards. Bob Edwards, who's a Marine Corps colonel, was part mm -hmm. of that group. And my husband met with in Bob Edwards in high school. Uh -huh. Bob Edwards went on to Fort Benning. He was in psychological warfare. In fact, he was involved with the subterfuge in when I, after I was injured and, and my husband socked me in the breast and I had to have surgery um, because he'd already broken a leg. And I was starting to document the violence. But I'm such an upfront person, and I wanted him, all I wanted him to say was, I'm sorry, Kay, I did this. But I was trying to do, like they said Rosie Greer did, you put a mirror, if, if you're battering your wife, you put a mirror up in front of yourself, or a photograph, mm -hmm. and you try to imprint the lower brain, because I wanted to save his soul. Mm -hmm. I mean, this guy had murdered his first wife, battered her to death. I mean, he dragged her body back. I mean, it was just, Sue had a cerebral hemorrhage. It, that's too much for me to get into. But he was doing that to me, and I stopped him from drinking, thinking this would stop the battering. But I started taking notes, taping things, you know, while he'd go in these rages. Because I wanted somebody to know. Mm -hmm. I wanted somebody to help me so I wouldn't die. Mm -hmm. And um, I'd had surgery. I'd had broken bones. And I was trying to reach out for some help. And so I was trying to get him to realize what he was doing to me. And I told him, I said, George, I know you did this to Sue. Do you really want me dead? You know, this is... So, but he started getting scared, and he was cool. Did he ever admit he, to you that he, that he was responsible for his first wife's death? He, uh, yeah, he, he, he came, he said... Um, he admitted that they didn't get along. He admitted that he didn't love her. That he battered her. He admitted that he, he'd hurt her. He admitted that he dragged her body back uh, after she supposedly collapsed at dinner. Now, this is a 200-pound woman. You know, she's huge because she's not happy. She's sleeping with her dog. <laughs> she doesn't sleep with her husband because he's too busy sleeping with other people. Mm -hmm. He doesn't find her attractive. He's sleeping with Nancy Earl, and, you know, I mean, it's, it's just the most crazy. And she's tr she loves him because, you know, he's handsome, and what is she going to do? She's never worked a day in her life. Her mother loves him. Mm -hmm. It's like me. No, who would believe you that a handsome, wonderful guy, you know, oh, but George is so nice. So, and this is what the wives go through. They know that it'll be hard. So... The, and the guys just, what, what George did was, he had clout in the State Department, and they knew that, that I just love showing people around. So he would plan something that I just had to do. I would be hooked, mm -hmm. like, like a hook and a fish. And he had some dignitaries who came over from, where did they come from? They were parliamentarians from, uh, I think these were from, one of the Latin American countries, Panama. And of course, we had to go to Richmond. So I had to stay overnight with them, and George didn't want to go with me. And it just so happened that Bob Edwards, his army colonel friend, invited him to come up and meet with some of the guys you know, at New Hope, Pennsylvania, or Bucks County, or wherever it was. Well, he had already been talking to Phil Holwager about the abuse because I had gone in for surgery uh, and I thought it was very unusual that Phil Holwager was there during the surgery kind of holding George's hand it wasn't for me mm -hmm. it was to make sure George didn't fall apart to make sure that the doctor I didn't say anything when I was under sodium pentothal you know covering George's ass mm -hmm. excuse my French but he was the chaplain at Fleet Marine Force Atlantic and, and was the chaplain for Sue's funeral. He knew what George had done. And he runs around on his wife, you know, he's playing golf all the time. I, he and George 
were playing golf with this single woman, and I found out, and I said, what are you all, you know, he's the so-called so chaplain, and he went to school with Gary Hart. He was a classmate of Gary Hart's at Yale, mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, a colleague of Pat Robertson's, that's why he, you know, not the saying that Pat Robertson does that kind of thing. I don't think he does. I I'm sure he doesn't, but they went to Yale mm -hmm. and so forth. But uh, so George um, was uh, a violent man, and he started um, knowing that I was sort of going to do something. So he started doing certain things. And, um, you know, it, uh, it, now looking back, um, mm -hmm. I, I can see why. Because of the, the violence, he wouldn't have been able to use his 45 anymore if he'd been... Um, Convicted of battering, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he would not have been able to use his pistol anymore, carry it. So they wanted to make sure that he was protected. So the wife has got to go. The wife is way down the totem pole. Um, it doesn't matter what wife, and that's the reason the wives are so afraid, the Marine wives. And they all talk cryptically, and, you know, they, they even talk outside the house. Talk cryptically. There's, a, there's code words and double meaning words. And, yeah. Uh, what's yeah. 10 p.m. Saturday TV? Satellite. Remember, doesn't we, don't we got a switch at 10? Hmm. No, no, it's Saturday. Sorry? Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, okay. I just thought I'd remind you. I okay. thought you used to talk about earlier. Yeah. Okay, well, actually, I think this pretty well sums up uh, okay. this segment. Unless there, if, if, is there anything you, you can think of? I can see where we'll do this again sometime um, as this develops on. Tomorrow, let's see, tomorrow Sunday, uh, Monday, what we'll do. Um, is it always, if, if we make a copy of this, so there's yeah, two of these? Yeah, in case sure. something happens Absolutely. to you and yours. Sure. Okay, we'll make copies of this sure. stuff tomorrow. Mm -hmm. um, don't lose that. No, <laughs> no. But this, this is interesting. It talks about sabotage, subterfuge. This is the standard army book, teaching men to lie, cheat, steal, uh, be peeping toms on women. Now, if they don't allow women in there and they can peeping tom all the wives they want, they don't need movies, oh. pornography. They, they, you know, it's, and they go on all the TADs they want. TAD is a... Just take off, just tell their wife they're going. And they, they can lie, because it's all secret. Mm -hmm. We don't have to tell our wives anything. And it's, yeah, it's intelligence. It's work. Oh, it's intelligence. Yeah, sure, it's intelligence. <laughs> it's... That's interesting, but this is this is really I mean uh, you know I mean, what, this is full of full of and this is just a mild seal commando T-shirt. Hold it up to the camera. Yeah. That's a that's a T-shirt that a seal would would wear. Yeah. Oh yeah. Leave it up for a minute. This uh, this I uh, played Nancy Drew, Miss Marple, and uh, I infiltrated if that's the word you could use, the SEAL reunion this year. Um, they spent a lot of money showing off, you know, jumping out of helicopters and, you know, probably $100,000 would spend, I don't know how much, but I mean the military was providing the funds for this little game on the beach at Fort Story. Yeah. And then there was, each one of the teams has t-shirts, which all sexual. Yeah. You know, all about, I mean, think about the, every the weapon. The driving motivation is sexual. of all this stuff is... is uh, Go for it. Yeah. So I went to the party. I took my life in my hands. I called a couple of friends and said, if I don't, if I don't come back, I'm at the SEAL party, and I'm going to pretend that I'm a SEAL wife. And I'm going to go to this drunken party. And, of course, I have an eagle on my car. Little old, they, they tried to get me to get rid of it. So you can get access. So I, I went in there, um, and do you know that 90% of the people there were men? They, they didn't have wives, this party. Mm -hmm. 
And the women that were there were probably... Yeah, know, they, a few wives, but feeling very uncomfortable. So I sort of got in with some of the older SEALs. Has Jarson ever mentioned the name of Lieutenant Colonel Bo Greitz? No, but I, I know who he is. Mm -hmm. um, and, but he has a lot of Army friends, not that he doesn't know Bo Greitz. I'm uh -huh. sure that Bo Greitz is, is well known to, to some of these guys. Mm -hmm. I, I believe he's Army. Could be. I, I'm sure he's not a Marine. I know he's not a Marine. Huh. I, I don't believe he's a Marine. Okay. But he's a he's a gorilla. He's a commando. Yeah, but his his name didn't come up as anything in intelligence. So. No, my husband was way above Bo Greitz's level. My husband mentioned uh, people like um, McFarlane and uh, Crow. Crow was his tennis buddy, I think. You know, uh, Hag, Alexander Kissinger, Hague. the. Uh, Victor Krulak. Uh, see, Gray is is the control guy. Gray and and Joy. Mm -hmm. Joy's big guy because and but Joy lost his job at Morale, Welfare, and Recreation. I believe because I told somebody that it, maybe that he I didn't think he wasn't because of me that he lost his job, but they made him move on somewhere else. Uh -huh because he was at Morale Welfare Recreation, which is uh, kind of a, a money laundering thing. They run all the officers clubs, all the um, recreation. It's not a private, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's all run by the military, even though it's supposedly not military. Mm -hmm. And they give the good old boys these, these jobs. I mean, he was probably earning $200,000. The retirement for a colonel, my husband, just the, the retirement salary was fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000. Then they give them these other jobs, so their income is two hundred, three hundred thousand dollars mm -hmm. $300,000. Now, that is not right. But it would certainly purchase loyalty. Oh, definitely. They all get swimming pools behind their house. Who's, who's ever going to bite the hand that feeds that good? No, nobody. Dirty business, you know, but all of the captains and all of the admirals know this and wink. And it's, it's sick, sick. <sighs> it's just really, really, really bad. And these are, this is taxpayer money. Hard working people who are just wondering where the money is going to come from to, to pay their taxes. Mothers of children who are having to work two jobs to feed their three children. And they're spending $10 million on phallic-shaped weapons. I went to the Army show just, just last week. I was up there. They had a hearing on Okinawan... Uh, rapes a day, you know, they call it a, a murder rape a day or whatever, you know, crime a day by Marines in, in Okinawa. When I went up there, John Conyers had a hearing and, and they also had the Army show, which I had gone to a couple of years before. And in the basement of the, uh, this big hotel, they have these 200 or more vendors of weapons. Israel is, is in, has a joint venture, IAI, has a joint venture with, is it TRW, TWR, that does all the uh, credit reports yeah. on Americans. Whoa. Now, they have the computers together. The Israelis stole the whole INS law system and sold it back to the Justice Department. And there were murders over that. Mike Fuller knows all. Mike Fuller was a former assassin who's talking and they are after him. Believe me, I met him through Sarah. <coughs> he and oh, um, is that, what about this Victor Marchenko? Um, you're you're pictured with him. What's yeah? What's that all about? Well, he is a typical example of the mercenary who is brought over from Czechoslovakia, Poland, uh, Romania, mm -hmm. the Eastern Bloc countries who were actually KGB, double agents. Oh, Marchenko. Okay. The family, yeah, his family were 
Yeah, he, his family came over. They weren't even citizens. He, in other words, they bring over the young man. Right. They work for five years, and then they become citizens. Now, I'm not saying... I mean, if you... I've, I've read his books. I, I wanted to meet the guy. He knows George. He knows who George is. Uh, I read two of his books just to see to see if it's what George said, you know, to kind of mm -hmm. balance mm -hmm. and what these other guys. If you read Marshenko's book, you'll see what my husband, the arrogance. Well, sure, we're going to go into this embassy. You know, we're going to go, we're going to put a whore with this person and we're going to spy on them and what they're doing. And, you know, we're going to just uh, steal that statue just for the hell of it. You know, I mean, they... Now, when you multiply every one of the teams, all the graduates, and think, think in terms of 100 men applying, and maybe 90 go through most of the training, but they don't quite make it. And then they've got, you know, 400, 600 men who, are, who make it, how many don't make it. And then you multiply that over time, and then the ones who are, I mean, this banquet, I mean, this uh, gathering of SEALs that I went to, there were probably a thousand guys there. Now they break. They they have to do a cold kill. You know, cold kill. Kill somebody. Murder somebody just to prove they can do it, like ducks. Wait a minute. The seals. Yeah, seals. So like all thousands of these guys have killed. They've somebody. done a cold kill. Yeah. Now a cold kill would be a killing under orders. It's uh, a graduation exercise kind of thing. You know, it's it's. Uh, I mean, would uh, who well, would they kill? Oh, it's just, just somebody, just anybody. Just, just, get just go into a hotel and whack off somebody. You know, uh, for, I was told that for graduation exercises, the greatest thing they could do was to break into a general or an admiral's wife's house and steal some things, you know, personal items. And, um, to prove that you were good enough to get in oh, and yeah. out. Oh, yeah. And I, all of my underwear disappeared, my lingerie, my teddies. And the funny thing is that I don't know whether it was Michael O'Boyle doing it uh, because he, he, see, he was, from 1991 to 1993, Michael O'Boyle was three miles away from my husband. He was at his graduation exercise. He was very close to my husband. And, um, and yet he was just down the road, and I started questioning my husband about, you know, what is this about you and Michael? You know, what's going on? Well, Michael was there, and, they, my, and my husband never told me he was there. And he saw him all the time. And, that, and, and I'm looking back at when my teddies disappeared. But all this time, now Michael, had, he and his first wife had, had divorced. That's okay. But the, he had an affair with a woman and a child, a secretary. So he was having an affair with a woman. I mean, he's not, Michael is both ways, you know what I mean. But mm -hmm. in order to get into the system, he sort of did it with my husband. He was my husband's friend, younger friend. Mm -hmm. And that started when he was in the Seventh Fleet under Krulak and Buell in intelligence on the, uh, the ship. So, um, but Michael, there he was at Little Creek, my husband's best friend. He never invited him over, <coughs> but he saw him. Hmm. So I, I don't know if you can guess what, what that means. Um, but the, uh, the, the teams, the, the biological electronic warfare school that See, after my husband left FMF Lant, he went to the school, mm -hmm. you know, the Special Operations School, which ran the whole, the teams, foreigners, and everywhere. Okay, now the, the term Mac Sog, what, do, what does that mean? What is that? It was a kind of a, a code word for um, going out and sending platoons to kill people in Vietnam. Um, SOG is Special Operations mm -hmm. Group. Um, 
Special Operations, SO, SS, uh, OSS, Secret Service, SS, Nazi, Spetsnaz, the, the German um, stormtroopers. Mm -hmm. They all, if you know anything about the, the German high command, uh, it's the Brotherhood. It's called, they, they are con connected with the Opus Dei, which is an uh, Italian kind of a business group that works within the Vatican. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm told that, and I like the Pope, I think he's a wonderful guy, but I'm told that, that he was involved with that during World War II. Mm -hmm. I've heard that too. And uh, it, that the guy who was the Pope before was murdered so that he could get in. Now I'm still curious about the, the seals in this murder thing. Uh, Are we still on? Yeah. Okay. Now the, um, a seal, in order to complete his indoctrination, becoming a quote full-fledged seal. Part of that includes the fact he has to have killed somebody. Yeah. All right, and it could seal be team six, right? The the red team. Red team. Mm -hmm. The ghetto was the captain of that team, and his wife and I had wonderful conversation. And would she confirm this as well? I mean, did she confirm I, this? I with guess you? she would. She's scared. She's frightened. Most of these women are scared to death because they're warned. They, they know what happened to Sue Griggs. Okay, so, they but know. they support you, I mean, yeah. philosophically, in their yeah. hearts at least, oh, if yeah. not with their lips. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We talk about it. Uh, some of them have to go out of their house. Some of them won't even talk in the office in which they work. Mm -hmm. They've had men come by their houses. They've had their papers stolen. I mean, association with there, you could be the kiss of death. Yeah. Oh, sure. And they know that. But they, they, we talk anyway, and I, you're talking about some really brave women here. And when I talked to, there are a couple of colonel's wives, and a, some, and before I, I went public, you know, they were talking to me, except for Carolyn Millis was just, she turned just like that. She was the one who, whose house I was in when I told about the go-go dancers in the officers club and me taking the picture uh -huh. and thinking about writing the letter to the wives and she said, oh you can't do that. You'll ruin George's career. In other words, Carolyn has really bought into the system and she's very pretty and she's very influential with the wives group but she'll turn on you in a second. Uh -huh. And she it really hurt me because I was, um, you know, it, I kind of depended on her and Charlotte Moore. But when I went public, when I started telling people what I knew little bit by little bit just to get my courage, and then when I finally went to visit Sarah McClendon, it was like, you see, mm -hmm. I told you. Uh -huh. I mean, Sarah McClendon called my house, and they told her it was an army base. I mean, it was a military base, and they, that the Griggses didn't live there anymore. Ha, ha, ha. See this paper? You know, then I was totally shut off. But until that point, I went in to see Peggy Sheehan. You know, we had tea and food, and, um, and he was the head of NATO, Sackland. And his wife, Peggy, said, just... Kay, uh, this is so strange. She said, just leave a note on your refrigerator. Yeah, for George. Just leave a note on your refrigerator. Meaning? I don't, just, in other words, he's coming in the house. Uh, they're coming in the house. It'll get to George. This is SOP, Standard Operating Procedure. You know, just get used to it, used to being battered, used to being... Well, she was a worshiper of the security of the position, the money and everything, and uh, just don't rock the boat because uh, this is the way it is. Yeah, and, yeah. And we don't yeah. want it any differently. No. I mean, they could desire it If you it have more. to divorce your husband, if you, then, you know, that's just the way it is. But uh, it's cold calculating and yet so un-American. So un-American. I know what Americans like because everybody in my family were 
you know, World War II. My brother was a briefer for uh, the Sinclant, Sacklant staff. He went on to be a, a medical doctor. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. th this is not, um, of course, he got out as soon as he could. Well, you know, people who love this country and love its history, I mean, are just completely confused. Yeah. From cab drivers to yeah. bartenders. I mean, nobody can figure out what's going on. Why, why is it everything goes the wrong direction? You, you know what I say? Uh -huh. When I started this, it was like a, um, maybe a 2,000-piece puzzle. Mm -hmm. I know enough it's like a puzzle for a two-year-old or a one-year-old with six pieces. It's so easy to see. And everybody who talks to me sees it the same way. I'm sort of an interpreter. I kind of give a lot of the wives hope and the guys, too, who are already out and scared and, you know, and they say, hey, well, this little, this little woman, she's a real feisty, you know what? And uh, I don't know whether they're going to kill her, what they're going to do. And, I, and, and they say, aren't you afraid? And I say, yes. <laughs> I mean, I've had death threats, and I mean, it's been hell. But truth and light and what these other women are going through, the hell they're going through, being put through hell because their husbands are cowards and bullies. I mean, people who dress up in black, who hide behind trees, who shoot people from behind, who break into houses and steal their papers. This is in the Constitution. You don't break into someone's home. You don't steal their papers. You don't, you don't try to destroy the core that God has given them when they're born. Mothers have sons, and their sons are 18 years old, and they're, they were telling them, join the Marine Corps to be a man? It's not a man. It's not a man who does this. It's a pervert. That's why they're not joining up anymore. That's not why they're, that's why they're not signing up. They're having problems with retention because the mothers are finding out. McVeigh's mothers talked. Unabomber's mothers and brothers have talked, you know. McVeigh, guys like Colonel Ron Ray is talking, who was... Uh, Timothy, what's his new, the new, new boy who refused to wear the UN uniform? Oh, Michael New. Michael New? Yeah. These are the heroes. Michael New is the, is the MacArthur. Randy A. Bear is the future Patton. These are the leaders. These are the Americans. And there are a lot of them. There are hundreds of thousands of them. And just like in the days of Jesus Christ, these modern-day Sadducees and Pharisees are saying, oh, we're going to kill Jesus. We're going to get rid of MacArthur. We're going to get rid of Patton. We're going to get rid of, of uh, uh, you know, New. We're going to get rid of um, Colonel Sabo murdered him. We're going to get rid of these guys. One by hey, but everyone, this is physics, everyone, like Sue Griggs that's murdered, Sabo, who's murdered, the wives who were murdered, Ron Brown. There are a hundred people who spring up and say, uh-uh, now you got me to worry about. This is why these guys have got little places hidden all over the place. They're training all the, the, you know, the, the guys to just say, oh, well, the American citizens are bad. But the guys they're training are also going to, going to, wake up to what's going on. It's Casper Weinberger. It's Henry Kissinger. I mean, Nicholas Walt Whitman Rostow. Uh, Eugene Debs Rostow. The, what's going on here? These guys aren't even born in America. What's happening here? They're training mercenaries now to run, you know, flip around, we'll kill on uh, an order. Not killing because it's, people are breaking into our homes. Not killing because they're bad. But just, we want to control this country. That's what George told me. It's political. 
the military, the Marine Corps is a political arm of a group that wants to, to run everything, control the drugs, uh, sell the weapons, keep the, keep the weapons flow going, and this isn't uh, what, what guys are going to sign up to do. Their heart's not in it. They're not going to even do it for the money. They'd rather die than have hit squads come after them, collection groups from uh, Great Lakes. They have a, a group of, of uh, Marines who goes out and collects guys who have gone to their psychiatrist and they're a little bit talking too much. They get rid of them. But they're not told why. They're just told they're enemies or they've done bad things. So they don't, it's kind of like they don't, uh, um, so they won't have any uh, guilt and culpability. They, they make it cold. Just get rid of this guy, okay? Okay. Get a promotion. Get a new car. Get some stock. Uh, after my husband did what he did in Beirut, there, I found these stubs. He got all this stock. You know, AT&T, major stock, just thousands of dollars worth of stock. And it was from a, a, a company that was like a quasi-government company, all on a, a sheet of paper. And, of course, it was, it was big, big-time stock. And that's how he was paid off, stock. And, and paid off for? For doing criminal activities, selling weapons, going through uh, Tel Aviv, the, the bank in Rome, mm -hmm. selling the weapons illegally. The, the Israeli agents are the, are the middlemen. And all the money's going to Israel. A lot of, I mean, it really is the truth. Mm -hmm. The money, not just the money that is given to them free and clear, Mm -hmm. But all the criminal, the black budget money that Meyer Lansky's group started back in the 40s has been growing and growing and growing. It's like a pyramid scheme. And the Jesuits, I've been told, are really controlled by this, this group now. I don't, you know. Um, now, surely, Ollie North is a good guy. No, I think he was farmed. You know, he was, uh, but see, Ollie was involved in Vietnam with, the Jags, covering up a lot of the stuff that was going on. He was involved with a major case where there was a Marine. Um, see, George was, oh, George told me about this. See, George was involved with a lot of the cover-ups of Marines who went crazy. Like, remember this, A Few Good Men, uh, was it A Few Good Men? It was a movie about a Marine colonel. They murdered a guy from, Jack Nicholson played the colonel in this movie. Oh, yeah. You remember? Yeah, and he went on trial. Yes. And, and a George good guy George was the chief of staff who tried to cover this up. <coughs> My husband. The true story. The true story. My husband was the guy who was covering this up. They were so arrogant. And it wasn't, it was the, the woman who was a JAG, who got this thing going. It was not the, the Navy JAG, because he was going to cover it up. He was just a loose kind of guy. And if he had been the JAG, then it wouldn't have been prosecuted. But it was the woman who was working with him, because she was a woman, who, who, who got these, these other guys off. They were targeting these other guys. I mean, they would have put him in jail just for a little bit and, you know, let him out. But um, the point is, this guy was murdered. And the colonel laughed it off. It was down there in Guantanamo Bay. And George was the chief. Of, it was Al Gray. Al Gray. Hmm. That was, I mean, just that one. Just that one alone. And, and Lone <laughs> Tree, they were involved with that. You see, oh, it's, it's, it's just so sick. I mean, they are so easy. Let's break. Okay. I'll tell you. This I is tell you. A, this has been a tremendous. Um, I'm going to let you take this home and read this letter. Or did you take the letter? You got the letter. the letter. Okay. Take, take this and put the letter in there. 
because you'll see the glasses in there. That's oh, okay. <laughs> Bless your heart for sitting through all this. <laughs> I'm sorry. I couldn't stay down very long, but I'm here a little bit. But it's just, you know, it's my life.